Yeah, just roll with it. You'll be fine. So you're doing the uh, action. And we are back between G edits. It is the last day of the boat show. We are the AIM... What is it? A luxury pavilion. pavilion? VIP pavilion? It's got Porsche, it's got Glim, it's got Cat Marine. And somebody called Sheepdog. But sheepdog is. you are Ben Davis. That's right. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. A fellow you are the Yeti. I, well, <laughs> allegedly. No, 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 allegedly, yeah. yeah. There's, no, there's no hard and no fast. No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> I've seen him about. They seek him there, they seek him there. They seek him everywhere. So you employ one of our favourite people in the world. Who's that? John Mitchell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good I've, guy. I've known John for about 20 years. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and it's so good to see him back in the show because he's yeah, not been no, here. Yeah, no, it's amazing. His like domain knowledge of the industry and you know how Glint can potentially work with it, and we can get onto that in a minute. So John organised our, our whole event here. So he's done. Um, I'll tell him later, but he's done an amazing job. Done, it's John. amazing. John, norm his skin normally looks translucent. Yeah, because he's, he's, he's got a vague a, tan right now. He's got a vague tan. He could be the Yeti. <laughs> or double up as his <laughs> unborn child, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. That's so, wrong. go on. Glint sounds like it's a, an actual real form of Bitcoin. Is that the way you would transcribe? You would describe it? We're no. Okay. okay. Let's, not, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's not. It's an interesting way to put it because actually CNBC was comparing Glint versus uh, Bitcoin and saying we're the real deal. Yeah. So so yeah, you're not completely wrong, but I, I don't want to confuse people by introducing Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies into it. We are not a cryptocurrency. We are a company that has enabled physical gold that's owned by you to be spent anywhere in the world where MasterCard is, or the value is transferred through the payment system. So. We're a UK-based company. We have uh, regulatory uh, authorization from the banking system, Financial Conduct Authority in the UK and Europe. And we've been issuing cards into that region of the world. It's been so successful in the last nine months that we bring our uh, business to the US. So we now have a, an office in Boulder. It's like one of the, one of the premier, this is where <laughs> Kelly's from who's helping us today. So um, uh, Kelly's uh, running our marketing in, uh, in Boulder, so, which is great. And uh, so I, I met Kelly for the first time just recently. But going back to the product, um, we, we're, we're launching in uh, Boulder. It's one of the best, uh, it's one of the fastest growing fintech hubs uh, or technology hubs in the US. Really? Yeah, and it's got operations, banking operations in Denver. So we've got a lot of pool of talent. And also our partners, AIM, who we are here with today, our distribution partners. So they they have sort of five channels, home and house, equine, uh, outdoor activities, healthy living, and marine. So AIM Marine, uh, okay. we've been partnering with AIM Marine down here to- um, They're really not get... a bad company to partner with, by the way. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, no, they've, they've been amazing. Um, it's very rare to find partners who just have you know, a, you know, deep affinity for it. It's great. So we actually, we, we, we're leasing office space about 8,000 square feet in their, uh, in their office. So it's, it's, it's a great partnership. Really yeah, so, so we're growing. Oh, so so you, yeah. you get a debit card, yeah. it's an app, yeah. and basically everything, it's like having gold in the bank account. Yeah. So clients, Isn't this the way that banks used to do things actually? Bingo. So gold was once money. And yeah, I'll give you an example. So an ounce of gold used to buy you a nice toga in Roman times. Yeah. It used to buy you a nice tunic in Middle Age times. And they gave you an IOU to use. Well, that's when it was physical gold and I just handed you an ounce of gold. Right. Or a denarii in Roman times. But today, an ounce of gold will buy you a nice suit. If you think about it, or a lady's outfit. So you can see straight away that gold acts as a constant in terms of a store of value right across the ages, which is why, you know, in many ways, what Bitcoin has done, you know, just to bring that back into the equation. I apologize is, why I'm so hot, I don't yeah, know. It's because you're, you're in that suit all the time. <laughs> your body just can't acclimatize. I can feel that, I'm just sweating, sweating away, yeah. Because yeah. you're nervous, you're nervous. No, no, you're I am, I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it should be the other way around, shouldn't it? But uh, I think being in a woolen suit for in this 28 degree heat might have something to do with that. But maybe. anyway, maybe the Yeti, that is you. Maybe. Maybe the Yeti. So back on the, let's forget Bitcoin, let's get back on the goal. So what we're trying to do here is we're providing 
ostensibly a savings and payments platform. So people can save in gold and they can spend out of that savings. So if you purchase gold every month or you put your salary in to our accounts every month, so you can transfer with a, a card payment or through a bank transfer, we can pull it straight into our accounts and then you convert that into gold or we do it straight away for you. And then you can spend the value of that gold as it starts to accumulate in value over time. And so you actually physically hold the gold? Yeah, so this is the great thing. Is you as an individual... This is what the US used yeah. to do. Let, let, let's, let, let's make it really simple. If I could offer you a bank account, all the functionality of your ordinary bank account, but probably with a better user experience, modern technology, better user interface, more seamless and frictionless in terms of transacting, speed of processing to open an account and multiple currency accounts done in two minutes we put you through what's known as kyc know your client anti-money laundering uh, procedures because we're a regulated entity you then come onto the platform we monitor all your transactions for fraud we block cards if we see there's any fraud behavior going on we've got sophisticated ai that, and machine learning that's constantly trying to be ahead just for, Really, actually, we are probably streets ahead of the banks because we're more nimble in our technology. This is why financial technology companies are so disruptive to the banking sector. So just to finish off, if I may, so you have an account, you have all the functionality of your normal bank account, but you have one really amazing thing. You get to protect the value of your money. So if I told you that in your bank account, you lose inflation, you, your purchasing power is falling, I think we'd all agree that the standard of living for all of us, whether you're wealthy or poor, but if, particularly if you're a wage earner, your standard of living isn't cut, keeping up. With prices are constantly increasing, um, inflation rates are eroding the value of your money. So if you're sitting with cash in a bank account, that's probably going down four, five percent. The real inflation rates, three percent, but in reality, I think we all know it's a lot higher. Yeah. So. You know, your standard living is falling. So if I then turned to you and said, if you buy, if you open an account with us, and I could tell you, you could protect your standard of living and even grow it, you would do that. You would do that, right? And the way you do that is by buying physical gold represented in digital format on the app, and you buy it every month, so you're cost averaging in all the time. You will beat the inflation rate and more and grow your money. So. Huh you'll be able to start paying for the things you want in life, whether it's a deposit on a house, a new car, what, traveling, a new a holiday, saving up for that. Cool, that's all right. simple. There's your sales pitch. Right, now yeah. I've got a question for you. Yeah. So, the US Federal Reserve yeah. is a fictitious monopoly of 11 banks, correct? Well, it's, it's a real monopoly of 11 banks. It's a real banks. monopoly, yeah. okay. But they have no nothing to back it up anymore do they well yeah in theory on the bare balance sheet you've got all the the physical gold that's held at fort knox yeah and so it does there, make right? part of the balance sheet and it's valued i believe uh at uh, 32 dollars the chinese have all that though, don't they yeah so the chinese is great so you know your subject so uh, a little yeah a little. I, want, I want to start getting into kennedy in a second so the chinese have been accumulating gold for a long time so there is a, there's going to be a seismic shift in, in the, the monetary regime. At the moment, we, we have something that's called Bretton Woods 2, and not to get off on some big macro monetary discussion, but it's based ostensibly the relationship between the yuan or the Asian currencies and their peg to the dollar. Ostensibly, what happens is in order to keep their currency artificially undervalued so they can export goods in return for investment from America, they have to purchase dollars and sell the Asian currencies. What that means is they've built up significant dollar reserves at the central bank in China and across Asia. But what they've been doing is they've got all this debt risk now, US debt risk, and they know that they've got a fiscal deficit that really can't be paid down, particularly now Trump's coming to power and he's spending like crazy. So what, what they're doing is divesting into physical gold. And they've been doing that for a long time. They've got very significant gold. Divesting gold or investing? Divesting into, out of dollars, into physical gold. Into physical gold. Like the Russians are, like some of the European banks. Italy have got very large holdings. Switzerland has started to rebuild its holdings. It's amazing because... So the smart people are buying the gold. Well, the, the thing is, this is how banks started. Yeah. So physically, it got too much to carry around a yeah, person. It's not gold. portable. Yeah. So you gave it to the blacksmith, wasn't it? Yeah, the yeah. Blacksmith had it. And well, then... the goldsmiths, but yeah. 
And then they give you the, the, the notes that if you give this to him, to him, that's what started paper, well, current, paper currency. You've hit it now on the head. So people just rightly, as they amass wealth in physical coins, it's just, imagine it's the, and the, it's risky. the density, the weight of gold, as you know. I mean, to pick up a 12 and a half kilo bar, you can't do it with one hand. I've never held one. Oh, oh, I have actually, yeah. It's, it's, it's literally like that. And you're, it's that, you feel the weight. You can't just lob it. It's yeah. a, Hand it's amazing over. when they get it, you know, the, yeah. you, you do you remember the, the film Kelly's Heroes? Do you remember Kelly's Heroes? The black and white? It was a war film. It was, I think it was coloured, but it was with uh, Telly Savalas and I think Clint Eastwood was in it, but it was some World War II and they basically end up stealing this gold or, from the Germans. But the way they're like throwing it over their shoulders, <laughs> it's not like that. It's literally, oh my God. So very, very, um, it's a high value, high weight. It's product. funny because everything comes around in circles. You know, flares went out of fashion and they come back into fashion. Cowboy boots went out of fashion. That's fashion. But when it comes to the way a bank traditionally should work, yeah. your money should actually be gold. real. Yeah. So, so let's finish off your, the, the whole blacksmith to goldsmith. So what happened is people then said, look, I want to just deposit in a custodian with you at your bank and in return they gave him a promissory note which was let's say it's a hundred gold pieces matched a hundred gold pieces that are actually held in custody with them but then man being ingenious started to go well you know what I'll, 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 I'll give you a promissory note for 200 pieces so what we would call borrowing on 50% so now they're lending out some of their gold. And you tend to get malfeasance and misfeasance and just sort of generally bad practice in lending. And so before you know it, all these, there's too many promissory notes running around because they're seen as money and actually it's not backed by enough gold. And so that's how, as you're right, you start creating fractional reserve banking. As everyone probably understands, effectively, very simply, for every dollar that's held in your deposit is probably lent out 10 times. In fact, it's way more. So that's why when you have a bank run and everyone pulls their deposits, the bank can't find fund it unless the central bank prints more money to uh, you know, fill the gap. And that's when suddenly too much money comes into the system, finite amount of goods and services, what happens to the goods and services in value? They go up in price relative to the amount of money that's coming to the system. Okay, so after the First World War, was it? No, Second World War. Second World War. Um, repayment of the reparations. Yeah. The bank, the International Settlement Bank was started, correct? BIS, yeah. And that is the biggest bank in the world. They're, well, yeah, and they've only really got 12 clients or something. They're, they're the central bank of the central banks. Which nobody's ever heard of. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a I know bit, we did delve into bit, d well, tricky yeah, territory now. I, I mean, yeah, they seem to be. Uh, but a, you're the guy who's they're <laughs> going up against them, it seems. Well, like. they're. they're I mean, it's interesting because BIS do lots of reports about the macro economy and macro uh, prudential regulation, and they've been probably the most accurate in forecasting um, crises, which I find kind of interesting. So uh, I think very sophisticated group. They do do funding for some of these uh, central banks, and they facilitate you know bilateral agreements between the central banks. So I'm, I'm not here to comment about them per se, and that's not because I'm afraid to. It's just I think they're just part of that oversight of, of global central banks. Uh, and I don't think there's necessarily anything Machiavellian um, going on. I think there's people who generally believe that being able to move a few levers on you know, the money supply and setting of interest rates is how you manage an economy. But it's normally the what I call the pseudo-scientists. They don't really take into account that human beings are absolutely critical to the decision-making process. So you've got these subjective preferences. What you think is rational is, could be totally irrational to me. And that doesn't seem to function into economics um, thought today. Notwithstanding all that, going back to promissory notes, fractional reserve banking, what we're doing is effectively creating a 100% reserved bank. So we're, your gold is one for one. Where is it? So we hold it. So we hold it in Brinks uh, vaults in Zurich. We're also about in the US, where we've just launched, we're about to hold it in a major depository in the US as well. So you can have a choice of where you want to hold it. But What's we the most amount of gold you've ever seen? 
I've seen, well, I've been into a lot of vaults around the world, and it's not as impressive as you think because you walk into this vault. Well, it's al not like allegedly, 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 all the gold that's ever been mined is about the size of a tennis court cube. It's a little bit more than that. So put that into perspective. Because so say that again. The size of a tennis court cube. Is the is the amount of gold that's ever been mined? Ever been mined? Yeah, it's a little bit bigger than that now, but yeah. So that because it's it's. That weight is such a high value to weight ratio. That's blowing my mind. Yeah, because when you look in a vault, look at when they put the bars down, there's substantial gaps and they're all on pallets. So, and there's a lot of room around them so you can move the forklift trucks around. I made a film in um, South Africa and we went to the Kimberley mine. Oh yeah, yeah. The big hole. Yeah. And I can't remember how much gold they got out. But it, in my head, it was well. Look, here's truckloads. Yeah. So, well, it's, there's a lot of material has to be moved in order, in order to get to, that one bar. Yeah, to extract a very small amount of gold, which is why you want very high grade gold. You know, you know you, like over over, I think it's about 100 grams Actually, no, per ton. Actually, mines diamonds. It is diamonds. diamonds yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, Completely uh, different. No, but, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's a whole different subject. Isn't it? De Beers, you know, control the yeah. you know, supply and demand of the market. But gold isn't scarce. You know, all the gold that's ever been mined is, is still exists today. I would say that there is an abundance of gold, parts per million, per billion, of, uh, under the. It's just very hard to get to some parts of it. So, Laos, Cambodia, ironically, have some of the largest high-grade gold um, geology in the world. Cambodia. Yeah, but Cambodia, Laos, a lot of it, Southeast Asian countries. But Completely why is it off. hard to extract it? Munitions. Whole, those countries being Vietnam War, etc., Southeast Asian Wars, which has been carpet bombed. There's so much uh, unexploded uh, arsenal there, landmines. Oh, really? Yeah. So, apart from the fact it's not a great um, jurisdiction to work in, you've also got that hazard. So, when it comes to what what's the potential out there, is there like estimates like there is oil? There's like. We're not, we're not dealing with uh, end of supply of gold, and it doesn't really matter because ultimately I could have an ounce of gold and just change the decimal denomination of it to create all the money supply we need in the world. It's like, it's like um, oh, what do you call Bitcoin. it? Bitcoin. No, it's where you, um, oh, I can't remember the word. Never mind. Come back to me. We do it in England all the time. Yeah. No, it's what Venezuela did. Oh, you mean... They just added a couple of zeros yeah, yeah, here. Well, no, saying... they cut, cut the zeros <laughs> off. <laughs> you're, you're not increasing the supply, you're just making it representative of one physical ounce. Okay. Now, we don't talk politics on the show. <laughs> okay. But... Well, I can. We're going to just delve into a little bit. Will Trump attempt to bring back the US dollar? Gold or the US dollar? The US dollar. What's so that mean? Get, get rid of the Federal Reserve dollar. And it's what Kennedy tried to do okay. um, before he was taken out. Um, it's and a very. Is that a gold base? I don't know. It was, wasn't. So if I'm right, oh God, I'm going to show my ignorance here, but wasn't, the, wasn't that some kind of silver base? It was backed, it was backed by. Yeah, yeah, it was backed by silver. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and candidly with Trump, you know, I'm, like, he's slightly erratic for me. He says one thing one day and another the next, so I'm not quite sure what that's, his... That's what's great about him. Keeps everybody on yeah, their Yeah, he keeps people on their <laughs> so I'm, I'm not, His determination on, on, on this front, I'm not really sure, but one thing I do know is that there are now five uh, states, um, and don't ask me to name them all, but there are now five states that accept gold as part of the payment legislation. That's a big shift. Wow. So I think you were at a very uh, a juxtaposition in you know, geopolitics and just the political system um, that will make us a very attractive proposition. What, it's amazing that you can reinvent something that is one of the biggest institutions that we've all come to. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, but on one level, it's actually it's really simple what we're doing. Gold just wasn't able to be used as a medium of exchange until about four or five years ago when we worked out that actually we can represent it in a digital wallet. Well, there's vending machines, you can get little... Yeah, but that's no good, no one accepts them. The beauty of ours is that when I spend on my card, it's accepted in every outlet MasterCard is in the world. And if we want to do Visa, we could do Visa. If we want to do China Union Pay, we could do China Union Pay. But where we're going with this, at some point we'll have our own network. We'll be settling merchant, consumer to merchant straight away in a very cost-effective way. 
Love it. All right, so very quickly, how did you get into this? Is this your brainchild? Yeah, um, one of the co-founders. Um, I'll give my uh, my personal story. So uh, I was a sportsman growing up. In fact, all I was ever really interested what in. What did you do? Sport. So I played hockey, but um, so not ice hockey. Field How are hockey. your knees? Good, because I stopped. Luckily, I hurt <laughs> my back early enough that I had to stop. Okay. But you know, I was totally motivated by um, you know, performance orientation, and I and I had a serious back injury. And I, I wasn't able to go to uh, it was the Atlanta Olympics in '96. And oh, wow. I was in the squad. Were you going to be in the Olympics? Well, I was hoping to do it. And I, I'm not, this is so long ago that I'm, I'm not mentioning it to show off, but it, it's really how my life, personal life journey went. But I needed that drive and stimulus. And I'm never having thought about um, finance at all. Just came from a family where my, my father was an agricultural, my mother was a psych psychologist. And I was totally motivated to be a sports psychologist as part of my, um, yeah, in my spare time when I was playing professional hockey. But I suddenly thought, you know, what a marketplace is about. There are a myriad of people's human interaction. And if you begin to, if you can analyze in a, in a very data-driven way how people behave in the marketplace and ascertain sentiments, etc., you begin to understand trends in markets. So I ended up becoming a trader. Uh, that led me to being um, what's called a proprietary trader. I traded equities, interest rates, um, derivatives of those, etc., commodities. And it led me on a journey of having to understand how does the monetary system work. And I really began to realize in about 03 to 05 that there was this substantial buildup of excess dollars in the system. And actually, we were building a huge credit bubble that was going to burst and possibly take out the bank system. In fact, there was a lot of people close. You know, I was very privileged to be working in an investment bank where I was very close to that type of information. But I chose to process that in a way of, this isn't working. All of this is, is really an aberration. We are living in the aberration in history. Now, Anglo-Saxon emerging market housing is a function of zero interest rates or negative interest rates. That, you know, they're not real assets anymore. They're a derivative. They shouldn't be at the prices they're at. In fact, there is a ceiling to it because you can't fund you know, the, interest, the, the interest on them, let alone the principal. So at some point that bubble has to burst. And so beginning to recognize that there was going to be a schism in the, in the banking sector, I set up a, an alternative fund, a hedge fund, where we enabled people to buy physical gold outside the bank system and we created a return above the gold price. Cut a long story short, in that journey I began to realize, you know what, gold is money. And I was proletizing about gold it's as money. It's crazy though, isn't it? Gold, gold yeah, is you money. Yeah, just, you just suddenly go, I'm part of the problem. So I went on my own personal ethical moral shift and I'm a complete capitalist at heart. I believe in entrepreneurship. I think it's absolutely fantastic to create wealth for lots of people who are employed within our company and you know, small businesses that grow into what I call, you know, they're the gazelles that grow into you know, major uh, corporations you know, around the world. They are the lifeblood of the economy and you know, create a lot of productivity. And so to be part of not only creating that, but also creating something that could actually create a more stable form of money. And why is a stable form of money so important? Because look at the pop what everything's based on. Yeah, and also because just your psychology. If you're working your ass off every day, and then actually suddenly at the end of the day you go, God, I'm working so hard and I still can't afford to pay the bill. You just lose any kind of enthusiasm for your life, let alone your work. It's just depressing. And I think a lot of people, we're living in this kind of low serotonin society where we're all chasing this nirvana. We've got to work harder with longer hours to kind of have nice consumer things. So what you're life. saying is actually, this isn't just for millionaires. This is, this is for everyone. everybody. We're totally, so our, our actual mission statement, our purpose is to create a liable form of money for everyone. So myself who hasn't got a pot to piss in, <laughs> no, but, and you will start to have a piss to put in because if you just put in ten dollars and fifty dollars, a hundred dollars every month, you'll start growing it. It will grow in value over time. That's so. So, you so can we're treat totally it as savings, democratizing money, but also you can use it as <coughs> spending. Spending. Yeah, but we it's should like all, an ISA, those bloody well, awful no, things. But you, you should just be saving anyways. A portion of your wealth should be of, of your money should be saved. Yeah. And then the rest is just spent, and you can spend it through the card. And why wouldn't you do that? Because you're losing probably 4% in your bank account with inflation a year. With us, that's not going to happen if you're buying gold every month. You will beat the inflation rate. Historical evidence shows that. And I think people intrinsically understand that. 
So it's not gold is not the preserve of the wealthy. It's just the, the wealthy have a lot of money and they've w worked out pretty quickly one way to preserve it is to have at least 30% of it in physical gold. And so they're the smart ones because they've, they've had to work out how to protect their money. Yeah. So anyone can buy physical gold with us. You can spend a cent, you can buy a cent with us. Obviously you would like to buy a bit more because that would be more use for you. So we're demystifying the fact that gold is the preserve of the wealthy. It's not. It's not. It's for everyone and, and also we're talking about the West here because we're in a, the US market. But the affinity for gold around the world is manifest. People are already transact in gold but in a very arcane way. They're not doing it through a digital format. And we've just created that real ease of use. That, digital, frictionless, seamless way of, of, of transacting in the modern way. And that and that's, we're just doing something really simple. Yeah, it's simple and it's of the time. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful to meet you. At the no, no. Is this the beginning of the journey or Actually, how I'm long have you been doing this? Um, so well, we've been working on it for about four years and we launched uh, just over about a year ago, started this year, um, created a great user base in the UK and Europe. And the US for us, so in my past life I had a lot of US clients, so we're known uh, in, particularly in the, the Maven market, i.e. amongst people who are already engaged with gold, but we're introducing it to you know, mass populace so everyone can engage with it. And the US, for me, they just have the philosophical constitutional understanding of what gold, they understand it's a store of value, they like the independence of it. And people are telling us, I mean, the boat show, I mean, we're here really also to work with the, the marine world to see how we can improve payments, speed of payments, get, take the friction out, but also for those individuals to protect their money as well. And we're getting a really positive response. And that's, that's from the, the actual industry, let alone you know, the crew and stuff, who've immediately just gone, yeah, I never have to worry about fees again. It's free, free to spend, free to buy. This is. Uh, I don't often get excited about banks, but yeah. yeah. All right, sign me up. You're done. <laughs> You're in. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I know you can keep going for hours. Okay.